Now turn to section one. You will hear two students talking about libraries. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation, and answer questions one to five. Hi there, Tim. You look tired. Hi, Zara. I am tired. Well, it is SWAT vac after all. SWAT vac. Ah, yes, of course. Exam period. <laughs> Don't remind me. I'm pretty exhausted myself. I'm finding it very difficult to study. It's so noisy where I live. I can't concentrate with all that traffic outside. I definitely need to find a quieter place to study. Me too. Actually, I've just downloaded some information about the best libraries in the city. Take a look at this. It's the Bailey Library. The Bailey Library. Isn't that the really old library on Parkville campus? Yeah, that's the one. It's the oldest in the city, and it says here that it's really popular with students. Popular with students. That means it's noisy and crowded. <laughs> okay, okay. I see what you mean. But we could try to get there early to make sure we get good seats and a large desk to work at. It's open from half past eight in the morning until ten o'clock in the evening, Mondays to Fridays. Ten. That's very early. I study much better after midnight. Just look at the size of my folder here. I've got so much to get through. Basically, I need to be in the library twenty four seven to get all my revision done. Now, if the Bailey is that popular, it must be open at weekends. Yes, of course it is. It opens at eleven o'clock, in fact, and it closes at five p.m. Great. Not exactly what I call ideal for late night study. Count me out. Okay. Okay. Here's another one. The Brown Library. Ah,、uh, yeah. I think I've gone past it a couple of times. It's close to Stratton Street, right? Yes, Stratton Street and Royal Parade. Royal Parade? Well, that's convenient for me. My apartment's just a few minutes' walk from there. When's it open? Well, it says here it opens at seven in the morning, and you'll be pleased to hear that it closes well after midnight, two a.m. in fact. And we can go there any day of the week. That sounds ideal. Oh, wait a minute. We can't use it. It's only open to biomedical students. Biomedical students only. Great. Just when we thought we'd found the perfect place to study.、Mm. Oh, wait a minute. This one sounds good. The RMIT library. The RMIT library. I've never heard of it. Where is it? It's on Swan Street near the Central bus station. Swan Street. Ah,、oh, yes, I know where that is. It's a really long street, though. Do you have a number? Yes, number three hundred and sixty Swan Street. The full address is level five, building eight, three hundred and sixty Swan Street. Okay, I think we'd need to get the bus there, but that's not a problem. So when's it open? It's open from ten till midnight on weekdays. And what about weekends? Uh, ten in the morning, but it closes at six o'clock on Saturdays and Sundays. But listen, it says here it has excellent computer and internet facilities. I like the sound of that. Me too. In fact, I like the sound of it so much. I think I'll take advantage of their excellent computer facilities right here and now. And how exactly are you going to do that? Your laptop isn't working. I know, I know. So can I borrow yours? Now you have some time to look at questions six to ten.
Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 6 to 10. OK, here's the RMIT Library website. So we want the bookings page. OK, first of all, you need to log on to Book It. Book It? Yeah, that's it, Book It. OK, now it's asking me for my student ID and my password. OK, so just type in your student number. I think I can just about remember it. And now your password. OK. So next, you need to choose the resource type you want to book. That's easy. A PC. So now what you need to do is click on Location. Location. OK. Now it's giving me a floor plan. It looks like I've got a choice of 18 computers. Great. So click on one of the PCs. I'm choosing this one. It's right next to the window. PC number four, to be exact. So what do I do now? So now you have to choose the date of booking. So when do you want to book it for? Let's go for tomorrow. That's Friday, June 6th. And just click. I just have. So why isn't it working? Uh, you've got to go into view options. Ah, it's working now. Friday, June 6th. OK, so now you need to choose a time. Let's go for a late afternoon. 5 p.m. Right, let's do it. Great. It says booking completed and there's my name on the booking schedule. Result. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. You will hear a member of the Active Outdoor Club talking to a group of interested potential members. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 14. Listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. I'd like to welcome you all to our Active Outdoor Club. I'll start by telling you a little bit about the history of the club and all that it can offer. And there will be a chance for you to ask questions over tea and coffee in the lobby afterwards. You'll also be able to pick up pamphlets from the table at the back of the hall and if you wish to purchase any of our products, Bill will serve you at the front counter. As most of you probably know, the club was founded by Nick Noble about 30 years ago. He thought of placing an advertisement in the local newspaper or erecting a billboard somewhere. But it was the radio that he decided on to reach the most people. You know, other people who might be interested in outdoor pursuits. Just basic activities like walking or tramping. Anything active that could take place in some of the beautiful outdoor settings that this country has to offer. Nick was overwhelmed by the response he got, and the club soon grew from a dozen or so friends and enthusiasts to around 200 members 20 years ago. And steadily since then, to reach a membership of over 2,500 now. You don't have to be a hardened athlete or extreme adventurer. On the contrary, it's a group that encourages friendship and fellowship through social and recreational activities. The club tries to cater for all levels of maturity and both genders. In fact, anyone who has the physical ability and a moderate level of health and fitness to participate in open-air activity on a regular basis. 
I think our youngest member is a five-year-old boy, and our oldest member is a 75-year-old man. Of course, we have more challenging opportunities for those who are up to it, but all excursions are graded according to level of difficulty, and there will always be something for those families with small children. More about that later. I'm sure you realise that it's part of the focus of the club to ensure that our natural environment is kept as pristine as possible. We all have a keen interest in conservation, and many of our members contribute their time or give a monetary donation to organisations that work to enhance and beautify our natural heritage. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 15 to 20. OK, now going back to the grades of activity, first of all, tramping. This is very popular with singles and couples without children, but is certainly not restricted to those groups. Tramping is arranged for Tuesdays and Saturdays throughout the year. Most tramps are of a duration of three to five hours, depending on the weather and the terrain, and of course the time of year. You would need to check the newsletter or the website to find out place and time, and if you wish to participate, phone the coordinator who can give you more information. I'll move on now to walking, which is very popular with families, but open to everyone, and walks are arranged for every Thursday and every Sunday over the course of the entire year. Walks last no more than three hours, although the Thursday walks might be shorter. And again, you would have to check the newsletter for details of the time and area to meet and get in touch with the walking organiser to confirm your participation. Now, the Wanderers are what you might call a subgroup of the Active Outdoor Club. This group was set up to cater for the less active, more elderly or families with very young children who still want to enjoy the great outdoors, but without quite so much exertion. Bear in mind that the length of these activities is variable, but we're always home before dark. Any member of the club is welcome to join in their activities on a Sunday, which include visiting some of our more beautiful parks and botanical gardens, beach walks, picnics, and even boat trips to visit some of the small islands off the coast. Often guided tours can be arranged if there is enough interest. If you'd like to see what the Wanderers are up to, check the website and then phone the leader for more information. I'll bet you're all ready for that cup of tea now. But before I finish, I really must mention something that can be a lot of fun. A great opportunity to form new or strengthen existing friendships and a chance to explore a part of the country that you may never have seen before. These are our mystery weekends. The committee puts a lot of time and effort into the organisation of these weekends away, not only for health and safety reasons, but also to ensure that everything runs smoothly and everyone has a good time. There will be a charge to cover travel and accommodation costs, but apart from that, it's an affordable and exciting weekend away from the city. For more information, call the chairman of the committee You'll find his phone number in the newsletter. So, that's all I have to say at this point. Please enjoy the refreshments, chat with the others, and feel free to ask questions. All the committee members are wearing large red name badges, so they're easy to find. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 3 
you will hear a man called Frank talking to Dr. Lindsay about what he should study if and when he returns for further classes. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, are you Dr Lindsay, the returning student's advisor? Yes, that's right. Are you Frank? Your appointment wasn't until 2, but that's OK. Please come in and have a seat. Thanks. I like to arrive early whenever I have anything to do. That's certainly a praiseworthy habit. Let me see. It looks like you've taken a long break from school, and I understand you wanted to have a chat about what you should study if and when you return for further classes. It's such a big challenge. I don't know if I'm crazy for doing this or not. Believe it or not, I know exactly what you mean. Before I began working here at the university, I taught primary school for nearly ten years. It takes a lot of courage to go back to school. I feel more shy and scared than the primary students I teach. In the schools I taught, I found today's youngsters are very sure of themselves. In terms of intelligence, I have a lot to teach them, and the maturity level of much of my class leaves something to be desired. But in terms of confidence, wow, a lot more confident than I am now, that's for sure. Stop fretting. A brave man is a coward who refuses to run. Let's talk about your strong points. You seem an intelligent man. What is it you would like to study? You see, I've been teaching children for a few years, but I think I'm happier teaching adults. I think teaching students in middle school is much more satisfying because they end up being much more grateful for your work. If I may ask, what got you interested in teaching adults? A lot of things, I guess. I met my future wife back in my first year of college. She always complains that I was more interesting then. She says that now I talk like I'm seven years old. That's probably from being with children all day. <laughs> Again, I know just what you mean. My husband used to say the same thing about me when I taught kindergarten. Anything else? Well, yes. Fairly often now, I run into former students and we talk. Some of them are getting close to being grown up. I guess I think more and more about how people develop over time. So I'm interested in the results of education, you know, the final stages. I see. Well, coming back to the university can be both difficult and very rewarding. There are some problems unique to returning students, you know, older students like yourself. What do you think is your greatest weakness? Well, I actually think my confidence is getting better. I'm definitely overcoming my introversion and starting to be much more comfortable in front of a class. To tell you the truth, I'm afraid I'm rather behind the times about many things. It's more difficult for me to chase after the popular things youngsters are fond of, such as iPhone, Twitter, if you name it. I think I understand. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. How old are you, 35? People at your age still go back to school for further education. I was a bit the same way. I mean, I didn't study at university till after I had a family, a husband and one child. My point of view was a lot different from your average 18-year-old girls, I can tell you. Gee, that sounds pretty rough. A family and college? Clearly you weren't unsuccessful, though. It was, Frank. It truly was. My first term at school was extremely stressful. But, excuse me, you're not here to listen to my life story. We're talking about your plans. Is there anything unique I should know about you or your past experience or plans? 
I'm afraid not. There is nothing interesting about my career or plans. It's really not too impressive. Now I forbid you to talk like that. This is your one life, and if you're not interested, why bother living it? Don't be so humble, Frank. Okay, okay. My wife says I'm a wimp. Let's talk about your dreams a bit. You want to teach adults, you said. What would you like to teach them? Well, when I first came to college, I really liked languages and literature. A lot of people have told me that, for practical reasons, it would be more rewarding to choose business management as my major. But I made up my mind to study liberal arts once I got the idea of going back to school. I must say it's refreshing to meet someone who knows there's more to an education than computers and finance. Let's have a look at the university course catalog. Excuse me, Dr. Lindsay. Before we do that, could I maybe ask you some questions about changes in university life? I think I need to discuss that so I know what to expect. Of course, I'm here to help you. The biggest thing to get used to is the change in technology. Professors present things on huge screens, many of which are interactive computerized whiteboards. You can write on them still and use them like a touch screen. They're really handy. No more sloppy scribbled notes on the projector. Let's see. I doubt you'll be living in student housing, so I won't go into all the improvements there.、Mm, another major change that you'll enjoy is the plethora of resources available for students. As a student, you have 24-hour access to the gym and library privileges that include the use of school computers to scan, copy, and print. And of course, the media library, which contains movies from all genres, and most of the movies listed on AFI's top 100 movies of all time. The dining facilities are also not what they used to be. They offer choices for all diets, and you can expect a hot meal any time of day. Wow, things really have changed. I'll be sure to utilize all those great facilities in my time here. Thanks for all your help, Dr. Lindsay. I think that's all the questions I have for now. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear part of a careers advice talk on working freelance. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Working for an employer in a nine-to-five job has long been the accepted norm. However, this could soon be set to change. A rising level of unemployment, combined with a sense of disillusionment amongst employees with their workaday lives, is at the root of this modern-day revolution in the workplace. Now there is a growing trend amongst people of all ages and from all walks of life to opt for freelance work rather than working for an employer. It sounds a risky option and a potentially stressful one, but on the whole, the benefits of freelancing seem to vastly outweigh those of working for someone else. In fact. Recent research has shown that those who quit their jobs to work for themselves are the country's happiest and most productive workers. 
A study conducted by Dr Jonathan Sapsed from Brighton University's Business School in conjunction with the Arts and Humanities Research Council looked at a total of 304 freelancers who were pursuing a range of professions in southern England. They found that, far from struggling to get by, many were not only doing well but excelling in their new professions. So, what are the advantages of freelancing? Well, there are many. One of the most obvious benefits is not having to be answerable to a boss and having to face criticism or unfair demands. In addition, not being based in an office or shared workplace with competitive or difficult colleagues is another bonus. But what is probably the most attractive pull of working freelance is the freedom to determine your own work schedule. You are no longer at the mercy of a timetable dictated to you by your employer. If you have family commitments, these can easily be fitted around your working hours. Furthermore, if you have an off day one day, it's easy to make up time another day without having to face your employer's wrath when you are being less productive than usual. Those who work in creative and digital industries stand to benefit most from working freelance. In these fields, workers are at liberty to choose their ideal working location as they are not restricted to working in a set place. It really is an ideal lifestyle that many would aspire to if they were more aware of the options available to them. Lastly, to add to an already convincing list of benefits from doing freelance work, there is the financial reward. Freelancers typically work a 38-hour week and earn a median wage of £43,000, well above the national average of £25,000, and are happier than other workers. It seems that people are now catching on to the myriad benefits that come with working as a freelancer. Currently, there are about 31 million people in work in Britain, and already 4.6 million are self-employed, thereby displaying the vitality of the freelance economy. In fact, so popular is freelancing becoming that it has even been suggested that the government needs to devise a new tax and other policies to support freelancers.